So owners that are just starting out, they need to at least pay themselves what a technician would be paying. Because if they're in the field working, you have to at least pay yourself that. Because as you go on, you could, don't forget, as an owner, you are, you can take profit from your business. That's the whole point of owning a business is for the profit. Like a bonus. It is a bonus, Big but, bonus, but really yeah. it's not a bonus. It is the goal. Right. So don't think of it as a bonus. It is the goal. Profits are the goal. Otherwise, you just own a job because if you're just working for a wage and say, you know, it's $20 an hour for 40 hours a week, 50 weeks out of the year, you're going to make like $40,000 and that's your salary. That's what it is. That's your, that's a job. The beauty about a business is if we go ahead and you say, you know what? I am going to pay myself $40 or excuse me, $20 an hour, 40 hours a week, 50 weeks out of the year. That's my salary at 40,000. But because we're a business owner and we make the money, the business after everything is paid off, you'll have profits left over. And you are you could do whatever you want with those profits. The suggestions that I make, it includes taking portions of the profit and putting it back into the business. But then taking the other part of that and distribute it however you wish. So if you're going to, you want to take, say, 50% of the profits and put it back into your business and you reap the reward of 50% for yourself, that could be sub quite substantial. You know, if you look at a, a $300,000 a year business that operates at a 30% margin, you're supposed to have a, a, about $90,000 in profits. If you took half of that and put it back into the business, which would be $45,000, that means on top of paying for every piece of equipment, every bit of overhead, all the salaries and direct labor and all that, if you're operating at that level, you could put $45,000 towards the business again for marketing, sales, improvements, new equipment, whatever, and you don't have to finance it. You could just do whatever you want with it. On the other hand, let's just say you were starting out small mm -hmm. and you had a $40,000 salary for yourself. But your your profits were the 90000 and you took half of that and you had $45,000. Now, guess what? You're making more in profits than what you're paying yourself in the field. So then your salary, including profit is $95,000. This is the correlation I always try to make with the, with people that contact us that it's so imperative that one, you pay yourself and two, get out of the field as quick as you can because just in profits alone, you could make more money than what you would salary yourself. But most guys don't pay themselves as a technician when they're just starting out. And mm -hmm. when you do, then you're already prepared for when you do hire the new right. labor technician that you're already in the rhythm of paying them. We're just using the round number of 20, but then it's just an easy plug and play. Exactly. Business owners that don't pay themselves are truly hamstringing themselves because you really don't know what it costs to do business. You know, for example, you don't pay yourself to mow lawns and you only pay your laborers and say you just have one guy, but you're paying them 10 bucks underneath the table, you know, which was common you would base your prices off of that information and then it would be completely skewed because instead of having a two-man crew and let's just say for a full year you're paying $80,000 in wages with the labor burden included in a, in a legitimate business, you're looking at it and you're like, well, that guy is only, you know, he's making $20,000 a year. I have to recoup that 20000 And if you're basing all your prices off of that, you've already, your price structure is completely shot anyway. <laughs> So you have to be true to yourself and true to the business. The numbers aren't going to lie. They're going to let you know whether you're profitable or not. There's no like, well, I've tried really hard. Is there any way money's going to fall out of the sky? No, it's not going to happen. You have to make it happen. Yeah, what would you say, John, to the guy that says, well, I haven't paid myself out of the business in months because it's just, it's just not available for me to pay myself and they have people owing them money, and the, the thing's just a mess. How do you course correct? Because we're trying to intercept folks mm -hmm. 
who are just starting that can do everything the right way from day one. But what about the person who's clearly the business is screaming, we're not making enough money and they're not even paying themselves. How, how do you adjust from there? That's hard. That's hard. We've dealt with folks that have been really in dire straits. They, they're total mess. And it's a long process to get people back on the, on straight and narrow, but you really have to strip away all of the, the issues that you're having. You have to go back to square one. You know, so if you've been in business five, six, seven years, and this is this sounds like you, best thing you could do is you got to go, you kind of have to start from square one again. Really take a look at what's what your business is doing for the numbers wise. There's been times when people have like way too much equipment, and somebody could say, well, how, how is that even possible? Well, combination of things where you might have you might have five machines all let's just say we'll just stay in the lawn mowing situation you have five lawn mowers but only three of them get used and the other two are either out to pasture or they they're there for special occasions or whatever it might be for every piece of equipment that you don't have running we talked about this earlier mm-hmm. it still costs you money to have that piece of equipment mm-hmm whether in maintenance or payments or wh- whatever it might be, it still costs you money. So t- being as close to 100% maximum efficiency is the best option. Uh, if you don't need it, get rid of it. I will tell you this, there's pretty much no one that operates at 100% efficiency. It's, it's, a, it's, it's just a, a metaphor here. You know, circling back to stripping down and finding out what your numbers are, what your actual costs are, a lot of guys might do this, but then they realize they miscalculated what profits they were actually operating at. And then they've been working at a break-even cost or price, I should say price, mm-hmm. instead of uh, pricing their services to be profitable. Sometimes it's a matter of a rate increase to get back on course and then allocating the money properly so instead of, hey, we got $50 from this, and that just goes in the owner's back pocket, uh, it's like for every fifty, for every $100, you know, this gets broken up into, you know, we're going to put 15% on the side for taxes. We're going to put, you know, make sure our sales tax is, is put into a different section. Equipment replacement is put here. You start breaking it down, and you start to really see how much money, when it comes in, where that money actually goes. Sometimes it's not a price increase. Sometimes it's a it's just the management of the money. Like that's kind of what I was hinting at. Mm-hmm. It's maybe you are at the you, maybe you are at the correct price. You got there by accident, or maybe you did figure it out, but then you forgot your ways, the the reason why that you're charging that much, and instead of putting the money to the side for equipment replacement, or you know, for the marketing budget, you're, you're misallocating the money into, in something else. So if it comes to like with vendors, like if you owe money to people, I've run into this a few times, people were putting money to the, to, they just kept thinking, I just got to keep putting money into my marketing and I'll get more, more people. The more people I get, the more money we'll have, which is true to a point. But if you don't pay your vendors and then you don't have the supplies in order to do the services, then you can't make that money. And then you start reneging on contracts and you start reneging on, on promises made. So really, like I, I keep saying, you have to kind of strip it down and figure out where that money's supposed to go and know what your, your costs are. Bringing it full circle, in the last module you talked about kind of that break-even mm-hmm. hourly rate and calculating more than what most folks even think about of, of well, I'm going to have to buy a new mower, so I'm going to have to start figuring out that into my hourly rate and all the other things that you had mentioned. Once you come up with that break-even rate, then how does that, John, go into the price that you give the customer when you do add the profit on? Can you give us some real-life examples of what price you actually give to Mrs. Smith once you know what your hourly break-even rate is? Plus, how do you know how much profit to add to that? And how, mm-hmm. how do you eventually... No, what price to charge is the kind of grand question. Exactly. So it gets a little hairy at this point. Not too bad. But you have to know what your production rates are. Because you, you came up with this number. You added everything up and you know what this is. And this is the, 
this kind of relates back to the what you're asking if guys are off course. You have to know what your production rates are. So you know what, everything that it takes to do that service and, the, and what it costs you. Now you have to figure out, okay, if we take on this lawn using this equipment, how long is it going to take on average for a crew to do this? So you have to know, you have to really look at what your production is for each type of service. What we do is like, like with our mowing division, when we had that, we, I would know that a two man crew with the equipment that we had in place for X amount of square feet would take X amount of time. So, you know, you could take a look at it and be like, let's say a tent in our area. Mm -hmm. If we had a 10,000 square foot lawn with the equipment we were using, on average, because we would time in and time out of every job, and this is crucial, guys, time management and time tracking, not f just for your employees like, oh, we work 9 to 5 and they got 40 hours. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about looking at your times for your jobs. So with ma weekly maintenance for mowing, mm -hmm. you know, those are relatively quick services. They're 15, 20 minutes, whatever they are. You got to remember that number that you have that calculated all the things that it takes to run your business. What's the consistent thing among all of us? Man only has so much time. We can't buy it. We can't generate new stuff. We can't. We can't generate seconds. I, if I could get time back, that would be rich beyond my means. But we all we all have twenty four hours in a day, so every every hour that that equipment is in production, it has to have a cost or a price associated with it. So what you have to do is you have to take a look at what your averages are for these jobs and say, okay, a two-man crew on this, on a, say a 10,000 square foot lawn, just say it takes 15 minutes, okay? Because that was what our average recorded times tells us. For the guys that are mowing, you have to look at attributes like, okay, in the spring, you might have a lot of surge growth in the summertime, you might get those jobs done. Uh, with the surge growth, it's going to take you a lot longer. In the summertime, it's going to be a lot quicker because it's it's dry. And then in the fall, you might have increased in time because of the variable weather in the fall. So you have to basically be able to take an average of that entire season. And this is where the guys that have been in business for several years, they have the upper... They, they got to step up on, on this because you have the data that you've recorded from the past. And if you haven't, you, you, ha might you have to, yeah, you have to start to, as soon as you arrive to the property, mm -hmm. as soon as you take your little, back when I started, we actually had a key you put in and you turn it in and out of the ignition. Oh, <laughs> Nowadays, okay. they just got the little key fobs. Sure. But as soon as you get to the property and you turn the engine off, that's when I clock in. Mm -hmm. And then once you're done, you get back in the truck and you, did, you eat your Kit Kat, whatever, you, and you're done. And you turn the car back on, you clock out. Right. So I like to go ignition, you know, engine off to engine on. That's my time on the property. Exactly. And I keep that in a spreadsheet. It's actually available. It's the pricing matrix mm -hmm. where you write down each visit, time in, time out, how many employees are there, and then it automatically calculates for you what you earn per man hour. Right. And that's, that's what you have to look at. So you take those averages, you know that, okay, on average, it's 15 minutes for the service. Mm -hmm. You would take that times the, the man, the direct, two guys. the two guys, you're, you're going to build a price matrix or you could, like I said, uh, with, with Paul, you could download the thing for at the green industry podcast.com. But you would, you would look at that and go, okay, this job is going to be, we're going to find out like what our hourly rate is. If our hourly Excuse me, if our break even hourly rate was $100 per hour for a two man crew, that would break down to essentially like a $50 an hour break even point for that crew. That's not what we're going to charge because that means everybody's paid for, but there's no profits. So at that point, you would have to figure out what percentage you're going to mark this, this whole thing up. Like I said, you, you know, you have to figure these things out for what's going to fit your market, what's going to fit into your, what your goals are, okay? If you just want to do every single person in the, the neighborhood, you might 
have a lower profit margin built in just for penetrating prices, you know, to get the, to penetrate into that market. But if you are looking in your specialty and it requires a lot more equipment or a lot more time, and there's a lot of variables that could be, that are in there that there's a high risk of mistakes. And like with chemical applications, that's why we operate at higher margins because there's a good chance we could screw something up and we have to go back and fix it. And that costs money. So if we screw something up, we have to be able to cover those costs. You know, a lot of, if it's on our on us, you can't go back and charge the customer that. So that's part of the reason why you have to find those the, the proper profit margins. On top of that, like I said, you want to make sure that you could get enough clientele with your pricing, and the market's going to let you know whether you're too high or too low. But that's something that you right. you put out ten quotes and everyone says no. Right. Your price is too high. You put out 10 quotes and everyone said, yes, your You're, price is too low. <laughs> but if you get that like, hey, you know what? Four people, out, four people out of 10 said yes, then you're probably in the right spot. I know 50% close margin, that's what people try for. But if I get four out of 10, I know my pricing's right. Right because on the money. Because you're finding the right clientele that are going to pay what you want. So at, once you do that, you find out you could put that profit, build that profit into it, and then you just go to town selling it. So... You're not going to use the same matrix, the pricing matrix, for, say, lawn mowing versus chemical application versus tree trimming. Those are three different things. So what you have to do, if you are offering multiple services, you're going to have to really take time to go through and say, all right, this is our mowing. This is our mowing loadout. This is what it costs. The only thing that all three of these things share is the, the overhead. So if you're all operating out of the same building, the same everything, your your overhead costs are going to be the same. So that's pretty easy. You could just take, you know, cut and paste the overhead expenses and pop those into each one of those service offerings. The only difference is, is going to be like the direct labor and the equipment that you're you're operating with and that could change things. That that'll change pricing for it. So cuz you don't have you know, forty dollar lawn mowing, and then forty dollar. We're going to take a tree down, and then we <laughs> right. You, you don't you don't use the same price point, or excuse me, this the same price man hour rate is the is the word I was searching for. You don't you're not going to use the same man hour rate for each individual service. You're going to have to find because an arborist has more skills than a common laborer does. So therefore, their pay rate's going to be different. Same thing goes with the chemistry of doing lawn applications. And then from there, like basically, once you put all those numbers together, you have your break-even points, and then you have your prices. You know, having that price matrix for each of the services that you offer, is it's just a time saver because you don't have to think about it. Mm -hmm. You could just look at it. The information comes in. Let's just go with the lawn mowing again. We say, okay, it's a 10,000 square foot lawn. Bam, this is what we're charging. We're charging, you know, the $50, $60, $70, whatever it comes up to. Because you know that if it's a 10,000 square foot lawn, you could do 15 of them, or excuse me, you could do three of them on average with a two-man crew in an hour. Whatever your cost is per hour, you could sit there and be like, okay, we're supposed to make $300 an hour. And... We have a 10,000 square foot lawn and it costs, we're going to charge $100 to do that lawn because we know we could, on average, we could do three. So if we hit all three, we're making the desired profit that we want. We're paying for everything and then we have the desired profit built in. If we, could, if we find out like, okay, our break-even point was 100 and, or say $200, right? And we didn't exactly get all three of those done and we were still charging we're still doing $300, but we didn't get them done. We're still above our break-even point, but we're a little bit lower on our profit, but we're still profitable, albeit at a lower profit margin. What's your suggested profit margin for someone who's just starting out once they know what their break-even point is? I would go with like a 30%, just because you could take 10% of it, put it back into the business, and then take 20% for yourself as part of your owner's pay. It's a pretty easy round number. A lot of times in order to achieve that though, you really have to be more efficient and strip down your 
your rig, you know, your mowing rig, because you're not going to have all the bells and whistles of, you see some of these guys running around and they got five mowers on the back. It's a two man crew and they got five mowers on the back. They could only use two at a time. Why have all that? They're not being selective with the type of clientele they're going after. They might be like, well, we just have these on there just in case something happens. With our business, with our mowing division, when we had it running, we wouldn't carry extra, extra equipment just to have. We would have the machines that we're running with. It was easier getting around. And not only that, the, the other pieces of equipment could go on another trailer. So another crew could actually utilize those pieces of equipment. So if we were on a, a route that, let's just, for example, say you had routes that required 21-inch mowers, instead of sending a truck and trailer out, you could just equip a truck with you know two 21-inch mowers and then have a rack on the side with the trimmer and the, all that, and it's, it's streamlined. You're not paying for the trailer or a, a, a zero turn that you're not going to use on those little properties. Whereas if you have a you know, the big landscape trailer, you got a three-man crew and you have like an entire warehouse on the uh, on wheels coming after, that thing costs a lot more. And if it's all the equipment isn't being utilized as efficiently as it can be, it's just going to cost you more money. You're going to look at it and your prices are going to be higher than all your competition. If you're trying to keep it that, say, like the 30% rate, it's going to be much higher and then you're not going to get the jobs that you actually need. So you have to not only charge what you're supposed to charge, but you have to also make sure you are as efficient as possible. Well, what you just said was you have to be as efficient as possible. <clears throat> Number two, you have to actually know your time. You have to actually clock in and clock out at the property. So you know your production mm -hmm. rate. Uh, that is so important variable in coming up with your prices. And then number three, you need to know those fixed costs that what it takes to actually run mm -hmm. your business. And once you take all those numbers from, let's say you actually kept track of all your bank statements from the previous year and you can, you can really comb through and figure it all out. How do you come up with that equation then based on you got eight months of the year mm -hmm. to actually be like, Oh, I'm at $57 per man hour or to break even, or I'm at $80 per man hour to break even or $200. How do you kind of bring all those numbers full circle? Yeah. So if, for example, you know, let's look at if you had somebody that had a, a 12 month or excuse me, an eight month year. Okay. Okay. And say direct labor costs you $25,000, okay. but you're only operating out of eight out of the 12 months. If you spread it that 25,000 over, it'd be a little over $2,100 per month over 12 months. But because they're only, you know, they're getting paid for eight months, you know, that's direct labor. You're, but it would come down to about $3,200 that you would be paying. If you're looking at your fuel and your maintenance or, or excuse me, your equipment replacement, let's just say your equipment replacement was like $18,000 for the year. And that's what it costs you to put money to the side to replace it and operate that equipment. In a 12-month year, a season, you would be paying about $1,500 per month. Mm -hmm. But if you have a shorter season, you would be paying like close to $2,300. So you have to take those things into effect, if you're, if, especially when you're trying to hit your target goals for your business and your services. If you have like a $100,000 goal or two, whatever the number is, you make sure that that 100000 is divided by the season itself. So if you're only operating out of eight months, you take that 100,000 divided by eight, and there's your answer. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome.